my dear colleagues and friends, I call this session to order. The theme of this session, it will be improving human rights based governance of international migration. I don't think that I need to talk about the importance of debate about migration in Europe these days. This has been near the top of the agenda in all of our countries for several years now. What I do want is to emphasize my satisfaction that we are today addressing migration with a focus on human rights. I can sometimes be tempting for us it can sometimes be tempting for us to see this as a security issue. And yes, there are security aspects to migration, just as there are economic aspects to migration. But as political leaders who help to shape opinions in all of our countries, I think it, we, it is our responsibility to emphasize the humanitarian aspects of migration. We must not allow ourselves to forget that thousands of people making the painful step of leaving their home to find a better life in a safe place at above else people people like us. I hope our discussion today can help to find ways that will make it easier for all of us to address migration primarily as a humanitarian problem that focuses on helping people. We should not ignore other aspects but human rights must be our priority. And now I would like to welcome the Minister of Internal Affairs, Mr. Oliver Spasovsky. As we all know, the Western Balkan route for migration into the European Union has been one of the major transit routes for migrants and risk in the recent years. This has had a significant impact also in this country. And I'm sure we would be interested in hear directly from the minister about how this has been dealt with and the consequences here, because I know that you face a very difficult situation in the last, uh, last year. Mr. Minister, uh, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Isabel. Почтувани пратеници, членови на парламентарното собрание на ОПСЕ, почтувани представници на дипломатскиот кор, дами и господа, проблематиката на миграцијата, особено сега во актуелниот глобален политички контекст, е незаобиколен фактор кој очигледно мора да биде вкалкулиран во она што значи миниорнародна соработка и дејствување. Со оглед на димензиите, но и тенденциите на постоечките миграцијски движења, обсе со право во рамки на формулираната тема Зајакнување на мерките за градење доверба и добро владеење во регионот ја детерминираше и миграцијата како еден од приоритетите во градењето на квалитетна и ефикасна меѓудржавна соработка, но и во градењето и хармонизирањето на стандарди, вредности и норми кои ќе го подобрат доброто владеење, развојот на демократските институции и човековите права. Сите ние од европскиот континент, особено во текот на минатата година, бевме сведоци на сериозноста, тежината и заканите што произлегуваат од масовниот и пообем и потраење миграцијски бран од Блискиот исток. 
Таа состојба јасно ни стави до знајање дека ни е нужна меѓусебна соработка. Не само во насока на зајакнување на довербата, туку и во насока на интензивирање на заедничкиот координиран пристап во спробувањето со миграцијата. Република Македонија, како држава која беше изложена на најфреквентната рута од тоа миграцијско движење, јасно и практично ја декларираше својата решителност за заеднички пристап и решавање на проблемите, особено што предвидувањата не ја исклучуваат можноста од појава на нов и може би уште помасовен миграцијски бран. Во текот на минатата година низ територијата на Република Македонија транзит оствариле безмалку 700.000 мигранти, од кои повеќето се од најзагрозените близкоистични подрече – Сирија и Ирак, но и мигранти од Средниот Исток и Северна Африка. До средината на февруари годинава оваа бројка нарасна за уште околу 80.000 мигранти. Ова состојба налагаше динамични промени и решенија, особено во нормативната сфера, но и на оперативно рамниште, особено од аспект на институциите кои што беа најдиректно инволвирани во спробувањето со проблемот со мигрантите. Тука се разбира предничи Министерството за внатрешни работи, кој беше иницијатор на низа законски измени кои ја третираат областа на миграциите. Беа донесени измени и дополнувања во Законот за странци, пред се во делот на забрзување на управните постапки, и измени и дополнувања на Законот за азил, кои беа од суштинско значење за ускладување на домашните норми со оние на земјите од Европската унија. При тоа, со наведените измени во Законот за азил, им се овозможи на мигрантите легално да транзитираат низ државата, и да искажат намера за поднесување на барање за признавање на право на азил, како посебен процедурален институт од формалното барање за признавање азил. Министерството за внатрешни работи преку формирањето на сектор за азил најдиректно се вклучи во операционализација на новите законски решенија. Целта беше, меѓу другото, во тесна соработка со УНХЦР, со ОПСЕ и други организации да подобрат да се подобрат условите за медицинска и хуманитарна помош на мигрантите. Потоа подигање на степенот на нивна безбедност, намалување на бројот на кривични дела, собраќајни и железнички несреќи во кои се жртви мигрантите, како и намалување на кривмчарањето на мигранти. А се разбира и во насока на поефикасно рекрутирање на мигрантите, регистрирање на мигрантите кои влегуваат во Република Македонија. Неспорно е дека според анализите Овие цели беа исполнети. За подобро и по-координирано справување со масовни од прилип на мигранти беа формирани и повеќе меѓу агенцијски тела, кои врз основа на своите законски надлежности ги одредуваа мерките и активностите за управување со миграцијската криза. А во рамки на нивното функционирање произлегоа акцијскиот план за справување со илегални мигранти и план за одговор во случај на масовен прилив на мигранти. Истовремено беа отворени два привремени транзитни центри, едниот во Гевгелија, во близина на нашата јужна граница, со капацитет за прифат на 1500 луѓе, а другиот на север во Табановце, за прифат на 500 луѓе, кој функционираше како привремен за помош и поддршка на мигрантите кои продолжуваа кон соседната Србија. Тука мора да се споменат и прифатниот центар за странци во Скопје и оној за баратели на Азил во Визбегово. Напоредно со ова бевме фокусирани и на зајакнување на капацитетите на граничната полиција, како прв фактор на соочување и исправување со миграцијата, но и на интензивирање на меѓудржавната соработка, соработката со меѓународните институции, како и на имплементирање на низата заеднички усогласени решенија како на регионално ниво, така и со земите од Европската унија. Благодарение на извонредната поддршка и помош на нашите пријатели од Соединетите Американски држави, од Меѓународната организација за миграции, од Frontex и други, успеавме значително технички и материјално да го зајакнеме секторот за гранична полиција. Преку интензивната едукација, 
пак за која што впрочем најдобро сведочат над 160 обуки само во текот на минатата година, со кои беа офатени преку 6000 полициски службеници, ние значително го подигнавме нивото и стандардите на работењето на граничната полиција и другите пропратни служби. Секако не може да не се потенцира фактот дека за успешното справување со тие состојби во огромна мера е заслужна интензивираната соработка и на земите во регионот. Особено оние долж мигрантската рута, како и низата конкретни проекти и регулативи предложени од Европската унија и од низа реномирани меѓународни организации. Полицијата на Република Македонија имаше и се уште има конкретна помош од полициските служби од повеќе земји, чии што полициски службеници се присутни на нашата северна и јужна граница. Заедничките гранични контакт центри со нашите соседи, заедничките и координирани операции со Фронтекс и со Центарот за демократска контрола на оружените сили, како и Фронтексовата мрежа за анализа на ризикот во Западен Балкан се само дел од конкретните заеднички оперативни ангажмани во спробувањето со мигрантската криза и заканите од истата. При тоа, во нито еден момент не беа заборавени ни оние најранливи категории луѓе меѓу мигрантите, особено од децата. Со донесувањето на така наречени стандардни оперативни процедури, беа уредени збирот на постапки, процедури и начини на постапување на надлежните институции со идентификувано непридружувано дете странец преку сеофатен приот заснован врз почитувањето на човекови права и насочени кон најдобриот интерес на непридружуваното дете странец. Истовремено иницирано е изработување на стандардни оперативни процедури за постапување со други ранливи категории на мигранти во соработка со УНХЦР. При тоа особено важно беше да се максимилизира превентивниот аспект на активностите, пред се заради можноста тие да бидат жртви на трговија со луѓе. За поефикасно справување со големиот прилив на мигранти на територија на Република Македонија, надлежните институции вршат првично профилирање на лицата бегалци, мигранти на самата гранична линија. Истовремено се врши разговор со лицето со цел да се отфрли можноста дека одредено лице е потенцијална жртва на трговија со луѓе. Во текот на престојот, во прифатните транзитни центри, сите лица имаат и постојан контакт со представниците на УНХЦР, UNDP, ИОМ, како и со невладината, млади правници и други невладени организации. Воспоставена е добра соработка со наведените организации и доколку тие оцена дека постојат индиции на сомнение за трговија со луѓе, истите со врзани да ги известат полициските службеници, кои понатаму ги известуваат полициските службеници од секторот за борба против трговија со луѓе во оделот за борба против организираниот криминал. Истата постапка се спроведува и со мигрантите, кои што ќе се затекнат на територија на Република Македонија со илегален влез. Ова предходно, што го изнесов, е дел од низата активности во кои што партиципира Министерството за внатрешни работи. Јасно е дека миграцијата како проблем не е ексклузивен предмет на работа на Министерството за внатрешни работи, туку справување со овој проблем задолжително води кон инволвирање и на многу други институции и органи, како државни, така и невладини. Би сакал на крајот од ова мој излагање да констатирам дека ноторен факт, произлезен од праксата, проблемот со миграцијата не може да се гледа изолирано. Високите дзидови не го решаваат тој проблем. Минатогодишните случувања покажаа дека доколку нема заеднички синхронизиран пристап, како на оперативно, така и на нормативно ниво, тешкотиите и заканите ќе ги споделуваат како државите поединачно, така и несретните луѓе принудени на миграција. Министерството за внатрешни работи дава силна поддршка на сите иницијативи, предлози, проекти кои се во правец како на подобрување на справувањето со миграција, така и во правец на динимензирање на мултилатералната соработка. Длабоко сум убеден дека во тој контекст обсе може и треба да има исклучително важна улога. Впрочем, во изминативе неколку дена од оваа парламентарна сесија, токму незиниот тематски фокус и изнесените гледишта го потврдуваат таквото значење на организацијата. Ви благодарам на вниманието.
Thank you, Minister. Of course, OSCE can have a very important role dealing with this problem, and rise walls is not a solution. Thank you very much. I would now, uh, now like to welcome Mr. Gianluca Rocco, Sub-Regional Coordinator for the Western Balkans International Organization for Migration. The IOM has been at the front lines of addressing migration for decades and has played a particularly prominent role with the recent challenges in this region. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Mr. Rocco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Santos, Excellencies, Minister, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first start by thanking OSEE for renewing once more the invitation to, to IOM to be present in this forum. Migration has long been on the agenda of the OSEE and IOM, and OSEE, as well as IOM, enjoy a well-established and dynamic partnership with all the players around the world. The surge in the scale of movements and loss of life of refugees and migrants that we have seen in the past year has reverberated across the world and raised questions about the adequacy of the existing national and international system for dealing with refugees and migrants. It has brought into focus the need for all of us to examine critically the approaches and attitudes to addressing the movement of people and think of what we can do differently and what we can do better. This is the question that is being raised at the local, national, regional levels and at the global level, most notably in the framework of the UN General Assembly. OSCE has also been focusing on the subject of migrants and refugees and on the OSCE role in this regard, there is indeed timely. It is important that we all join forces and pull together in the same direction to ensure that we are better able to save lives, protect dignity, and find long-term solutions that benefit migrants and societies. Parliaments and parliamentarians have a critical role to play in a world that is, which is increasingly globalized and mobile, but in which people are also increasingly needed, needing to feed a sense of identity and belonging through the preservation and valuing of cultural origins and intercultural exchanges. Progress, even on difficult issues, can often be achieved more quickly and more significantly at a regional level than at a global level. In this context, we, are, we very much welcome the inclusion of migration on the OSCE Parliamentarian Assembly agenda. Migration is as uh, old as humankind, yet migration or human mobility rarely receives the attention, recognition, and true, it truly deserves. The contemporary discourse is overwhelming, focused on the crisis of the moment. Given the amount of media attention this crisis receives, and more importantly, given their humanitarian dimension, this is perhaps only to be expected. They will probably continue to loom large in our field of vision for some time to come. Regrettably, however, this crisis focus dampens our ability to do two important things. First, our ability to understand and appreciate the key role that migration plays in development. And secondly, our ability to look ahead and evolve a long-term long comprehensive migration and asylum policies. I would like to take this opportunity to place our current pressing preoccupations of the moment to look at migration from a broader and hopefully from a more realistic perspective. I will do this by focusing on three main points. I will briefly mention what are the three main challenges that IOM thinks should be addressed in the current situation, and then mention two of the main tools that uh, are being developed to deal with these challenges. The first one is a simple and obvious uh, challenge. 
is the demographic challenge. We all know that the north of the world is growing at a certain pace, while the south is growing at a different pace. There is, on one side, the need of more labor force. On the other side, there is an offer for labor force. The second challenge is the diversity challenge. Migration has and will continue to have an impact on societies and their composition. If we only think at the EU, so an area that we, we know very well, we see almost 20 million people that are not EU citizens, they are currently living in the EU. And 4% of the EU population is mixed, is living not in his own country. These diversity challenges have to be addressed, uh, trying to change the current toxic migration narrative. We need to return public discourse to a more balanced and historically accurate narrative through informed, open dialogue. Secondly, we need to look more carefully at migra migrants' integration in our society. The third, the third challenge is the humanitarian disaster challenge. More people on the, are on the move today than in, other, in any other time in recorded history. The number of international migrants has risen by over 40% in the last 15 years to reach 244 million in 2015. Unfortunately, among, among these 244 million, 65 million forced, are forced migrants. The last number, uh, the largest number since World War II. As a result, we see a significant increase in population flows of mixed nature. Already over 320,000 migrants arrive in Europe by crossing the Mediterranean, the Aegean, and land borders in Europe this year. While en route, most migrants face numerous dangers and threats, often associated with smuggling rings and other national and transnational criminal groups. This has led to nearly 4,700 migrant deaths already this year. The international community is confronted with the challenge of providing effective and co coherent responses to mass movements of population. And it's not just a question of attending to their immediate survival needs. We must also be prepared to deal with protracted situations of displacement. Crucially, we must find a way to ensure the protection of the human rights of all those on the move and provide the, need, the needed assistance to the vulnerable. While the range of vulnerability we see in mixed flows is vast, only a few specific categories are afforded protection, notably refugees and those migrants identified as trafficked. But the reality is that there are blurred lines between voluntarily enforced migration, between refugees and economic migrants. Similarly, there is no clear-cut line that separates and tra trafficked persons from many exploited or abused migrants. Overall, there is a range of protection and assistance gaps that existing frameworks don't cover. Therefore, our focus should be on addressing needs, protecting all those who are vulnerable, not on legal categories. Having identified these three main challenges, I will mention now a framework that IOM has developed uh, recently to try to, to address comprehensively these, these issues. Uh, progress has been made in building interstate dialogue on migration, both at the regional level, including thanks to the organizations such as OSCE and the global level, the two high-level dialogues on migration and development, the annual state-led global forum on migration and development. These four I have shown that states from around the world can offer together for, can come together for constructive discussion on migration, even if their perspectives and on and experiences differ. Last year, IOM felt that the time has come to bring together these different strands 
coherent and comprehensive way. The other element that I will briefly mention is the recently made New York Declaration. As you probably know, on the 19th of September, the UN high-level plenary meeting on addressing large movements of refugees and migrants took place in New York. This was the first time the General Assembly has called for a summit on large movements of refugees and migrants. We are very pleased that the summit adopted by the consensus of New York, the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. This consensus shows, despite different perspectives, that the world can unite around common principles and around core commitments to refugees and migrants. Now, we need to focus on the implementation of this New York Declaration. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, migration is a fundamental feature of our time. It is here to stay. So rather than seeing migration as a problem to be solved, we need to regard migration as a human reality to be managed. As we face the continues of uh, the continuation of simultaneous, unprecedented, and complex emergencies, people will continue to flee and resort to migration as coping mechanism or a poverty reduction strategy. We need bold, collective thinking and action to develop a truly comprehensive approach to the governance of migration that will ensure that the precious commodity of protection is available for refugees but it will equally create safe and regular migration channels while offering community stabilization and development programs to reduce migration pressures. You, the parliamentarians, are key stakeholders in the formulation and implementation of government policy and also in leading the influence in public opinion. We need your help to change both the content and the tone of the migration debate and lay the foundation for a roadmap for migration and mobility in the 21st century. We need to join forces and be ambitious. Dialogue and greater cooperation are paramount. More than ever before, we need to work together with purpose and determination. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rocco. I hope that the Declaration of New York bring to us a new opportunity dealing with this problem and bring new hope to these disparate people waiting for a new opportunity of life. I have till now 25 inscriptions. I'm going to close the inscriptions. This will be the most participated debate. I, I'll give the next two minutes for more inscriptions and I'll stop. And I must announce that uh, the, um, the statements must be only for two minutes each one, okay? Now I would like to give the floor to our friend and colleague, Mr. Filippo Lombardi, chair of the OSCPA Ad Hoc Committee on Migration. You will all recall that early this year, our standing committee established this migration committee to lead assembly efforts in this important field. Several high-level visits by the committee have taken place since that time, and Mr. Lombardi can update us on activities and plans. Filippo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Isabel. Let me first of all thank on behalf of uh, our assembly and our working group uh, the speakers we've just heard this morning and uh, yesterday and Friday. With your contribution, we really can uh, get a comprehensive picture of uh, a problem which is uh, much broader than we would have imagined maybe a couple of years ago, and which is uh, really a problem that can be dealt with only with this concept of shared responsibility which we are trying to implement. We've said from the very beginning 
let's get out from uh, this uh, image of uh, burden sharing and let's go through to uh, a different approach of the problem and the problem must be shared responsibility. Maybe many of you have heard yesterday the report I presented on behalf of our ad hoc uh, working group, so I will not repeat it. This group was created in February 2015 in Vienna, and uh, it um, consists of 18 of our members from 16 countries. We had already a couple of plenary meetings. We will have other ones. We had the field visits in Italy and France. We will have others in Turkey and Greece, first of all. Uh, we will meet the other organization, including IOM, by the way, the international organizations and body dealings, dealing with these uh, issues at European and uh, worldwide level in Brussels and uh, Geneva. Our goal is to come to the summer, to our summer meeting in uh, Minsk 2017 with a final report, a final catalog of proposals, of measures we would like to propose the assembly for attention uh, of our member parliaments and uh, of course uh, the international bodies. Before Minsk, of course, there is one important uh, one important uh, point which is, which will be the, conference, the ministerial conference in Hamburg, and it is there that the OSCE will decide finally if it's willing to take uh, his part of responsibility in the process. We heard yesterday from Secretary General Lamberto Zanier that uh, a lot of work is being done also at the level of OSCE, and I can assure you our working group of the Parliamentary Assembly is in permanent contact with uh, the uh, Committee of Ministers and with the informal working group on the flow of migration led by uh, Swiss diplomat working on behalf of the German chair of OSCE, Mr. Claude Wild, who is, by the way, attending also our meeting today and attending the meetings of our ad hoc committee. So we are trying really to coordinate the efforts and to come to uh, conclusions and proposals which can be implemented. And uh, these conclusions we know already will mean that there is a need of more means, there is a, a, a need of more resources. And this uh, OSCE has, we know and we heard, limited means, although it's, it tries to increase, but we will have to lobby our national parliaments and governments in order to get more support for this international task because we believe it is a shared responsibility. It is also a responsibility we have to deal with uh, in our, uh, and with our organization. Now, uh, it was uh, uh, absolutely correct to hear a few minutes ago that uh, migration is part of the uh, history of the mankind. It has always existed. It has always had beneficial uh, eff um, effects, and it ha always had also some negative uh, impacts, at least on the short, on the short term. Um, today, the problem is not the migration in search, it's the sudden increase of this flow in a way which is difficult to control and which creates imbalances. Imbalances in the countries of origin. I said yesterday, and some colleagues were surprised uh, and came to me after saying, how can you say this? But I still mean it. Uh, the purpose of our policies cannot be to empty some countries of their population, or at least of their young, dynamic male population, uh, in order to transfer them for the needs of the labor market in some other countries, or to transfer them so that they will finance the, fund, the, the pensions of, uh, of uh, our uh, elderly people. This cannot be as such the goal of uh, uh, the policy of a developed and civilized uh, world. Why? Why? Because uh, uh, the countries of origin have their own rights, have the right to have a population which is uh, able to uh, contribute to the development of this country if we are able to implement proper development uh, policies. So our uh, roundtable this morning is uh, uh, based, basically devoted to human rights in this field. But 
Let's say that the first human right, if we speak about countries of origin, the first human right of people is to live at home, to live a decent life at home with a decent perspective to contribute to the development of their own country and to live within, uh, in accordance with their roots and their traditions. This is certainly the first uh, uh, human, human right. The destabilization, the poverty, and protracted conflicts are denying this basic human right in the countries of origin. And then we have all along the flow of uh, migrants during the transit, we have a second level of human rights we absolutely want and security. We absolutely have to uh, ensure it is the rights of these migrants to be treated uh, according to the basic uh, human rights and to have their own security during the, 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 the movement. You have uh, quoted, Mr. Rocca, the number of um, casualties in the uh, field of uh, migration this year. We don't forget that two-thirds of these casual casualties worldwide happened in the central Mediterranean uh, uh, route, and this is a, a question we still have to, to, to answer. So human rights there have to be ensured. We didn't need a lot of field visits to discover one evidence which all of us already know. It's the gender uh, discrimination in this kind of uh, movement. Practically every woman with whom we could speak admitted having been raped at a certain moment. And uh, it seems to be quite normal. It's a way of getting protection. It's a way for, uh, for uh, getting uh, support. It's a way for paying the, 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 the trip whatsoever. But it's a way, when you are I even in the camps, in the hotspots and in the camps, then it's a way to get some uh, protection from somebody. It is a, a clear, a clear, and uh, I remember Eddie Free always uh, uh, rem uh, recalling the, the, the gender question in this particular field, but it is something incredible we are, we are uh, uh, observing at the moment. And myself, not having dealt so much with this question before, was surprised from what I had to discover in some talks. Then we have to combat in this field with a very higher, much higher determination, all the human trafficking around this migration phenomenon. It has been already recalled in previous conferences, and it is being calculated internationally, that um, the business of uh, migration today is by far larger of the sum of the drug business worldwide, of the illegal weapons trafficking and of prostitution. It has become the business of the world and it is of course very interesting for every possible criminal organization to put their hands there. Even by managing some of the camps where uh, the migrants are supposed to be supported and when they are finally exploited or at least controlled and uh, directed uh, maybe to some criminal uh, activities. And then we have the question of human rights in the countries of destination. This is all the, the, the discussion we made constantly about um, integration. Interestingly, I spoke yesterday with the president of Macedonia speak, uh, telling us here our policy is integration without assimilation. It's a different concept than you may have in other countries where you try to integrate and assimilate with the concept somehow of a melting pot. We, we, we love in our country to keep the different identities, making them living together. It works, as long as it works. And uh, this is uh, an extreme, uh, a very valuable approach. We have to take note of it. We don't have to think we come with an international or a European or OSCE solution which must be equal for everybody. No, we have to respect the different traditions. What we have to ensure is that human rights are kept at the center of the preoccupations uh, of those uh, who are in charge in, uh, in all these uh, countries. Because it's quite, unfortunately, quite easy to divert from the right path and to go into radicalization of every kind. Different communities leaving aside, 
can be very well integrated. Um, speaking of Switzerland, because I'm coming from there and we live, uh, we, we, it's not true that all Swiss citizens speak German, Italian, French. I can assure you it's not true. I'm one of the few ones who do. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the reality is that we are able to have over centuries different communities living in the same country and, um, and, uh, and appreciating each other. But it is always possible that you get radicalization. And we know other countries, even in Europe, where at a certain moment this sentiment of unity, despite diversity, was uh, destroyed. And then the fights between communities started. And this is what can always happen if we are not very, very uh, cautious and very uh, present with all authorities, all institutions aiming at the same goal. Radicalization means in many of our European countries at the moment, anti-immigration uh, movements, political exploitation of these political pur for political purposes. It also means, we know and we have to, 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 to quote it, radicalization internally in some of the migrant uh, groups. And uh, it is not possible to deny that the, some Islamistic movements are present also in these. Um, and they are sometimes even happy that, it is, that, there is a, that they can provoke a radicalization on the other side. It belongs to the tactics of politics uh, worldwide in the history. You can radicalize yourself only if you find someone enough radical on the other side. So these, uh, these uh, dialectics of radicalization on both sides is unfortunately a basic element we have to consider, we have to know it exists, and the task of our governments, of our parliaments, is to work against this radicalization on both fronts, really trying to integrate, really trying to offer to every community the possibility to live and uh, develop in, in, in freedom, in peace, and with the respect of its human rights. So, I conclude. It is a shared responsibility, we say. It is a shared responsibility of many countries, of all OSCE participating states, to work together for the sta stabilization of the situation and against destabilization in many countries, for peace processes against protracted conflicts, for development projects against poverty, it is our duty to support neighboring countries of the countries of origin of many migrants so that it is possible for them, when situation has been re-stabilized, to come back easier to their country of origin. But this kind of support need a strong solidarity, need solidarity of all the other countries who have to put the mean at the disposal of these um, neighboring countries. And finally, it is a joint a shared responsibility to make routes more sure, to make uh, the integration processes more effective and more uh, workable. I thank you for your attention and your working group on uh, ad, hoc work, ad hoc committee sorry, on the migration will go on working and will present this report finally in Minsk to this assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo, for your work. And I hope that in the Ministerial Council in Hamburg, we can see measures to the ground and we can see no longer an informal group to deal with this problem of migration and refugees, but a special mission to deal with this uh, problem. So, uh, my advisors are saying that I can be a little bit more generous in the debate and give one minute more to each speaker. Uh, so, now we will move to the debate. And to start this debate, I will give the floor to, Mr. to Mrs. Paolo Niemi from Finland. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
People have throughout history left their homes and moved long distances. The present migration flows to Europe, present, however, some new features. As the title of this se session suggests, today we have a number of internationally approved norms, guidelines, and principles for dealing uh, with migration. The principle of free movement, as well as the rights of refugees, have been confirmed in a number of international conventions and documents which the majority, majority of the OEC participating states have adhered to. So the question is, what should we do to improve human rights-based governance of international migration? In my mind, one way would be to improve the available information about immigration and asylum procedures at all levels, to all parties concerned, in the languages concerned, and using all available modern communication possibilities. Offering correct, accurate, and comprehensive information about procedures, as well as about the circumstances in the desired countries of destination can avoid misunderstanding, frustration, disappointment, and even personal tragedies. Many migrants resolve to seeking help and buying services from human traffickers, as we know. This is obviously an area where the international community needs to do more. Abusing and making profit from the distress of people should not only be condemned, but also prosecuted. Special attention should be given to vulnerable groups, such as persons with dis disabilities, women, children, elderly, and unaccompanied uh, minors. Among the asylum seekers, refugees, and other persons in need of protection and addressing their special needs. Obviously, all the above measures will not be successful unless sufficient personal staff resources be deployed to put all these measures into action. This applies both to human resources in the international organizations as well as in nation states. In conclusion, it would seem that the international community and the individual states already have a great number of working instruments. Efforts should be focused on implementation, on information, awareness raising, and allocating sufficient human resources in order to put the principles and procedures into action. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Mrs. Dobezova from Czech Republic. Thank you for the floor. Uh, dear Madam Chair, dear distinguished colleagues, migration in time of globalization brings challenges, but also important risk of vulnerability and discrimination. If migrants do not have an access to human rights, their possibility to profit from migration is limited, as is their potential contribution to the development of the society in which they live. In my opinion, protecting human rights is important to promote the integration of migrants and their social inclusion. It enables them to lead economically productive as well as culturally and socially en enriching lives in the receiving society will benefit from it. Protecting human rights is a legal obligation. Moreover, it is a matter of public interest. I understand that uh, the international governments of migration as a process in which the combined framework of legal norms and organizational structures shape how states act in response to international migration. However, our problem in Europe is that we have lost international governments of migration. We are facing an unprecedented migration pressure. The Paris attacks in November 2015 and late attacks in Germany clearly showed that irregular migratory flows could be used by ter terrorists to enter the EU. Because of this, our citizens are more and more afraid of rising immigrants' criminality committed in Europe. 
We should not cover our eyes, but face this. In this respect, we must also think about safeguarding the human rights of our citizens. Our current failure to control and stop illegal migration undermines public confidence in the integrity of our government's policy. I am very concerned about the fact that present irregular migration could threaten existence of our democratic societies in Europe. Therefore, we should do everything possible to get international governments of mig uh, migration under control again. It is necessary to undertake all steps to grant asylum to eligible applicants from outside EU territory in order to avoid disappointment of our SX unsuccessful migrants, which often leads to frustration, violence, and criminality. If we accept the legitimate asylum seekers, if we focus on their integration into our society, we could preserve human rights on both sides, migrants and our citizens as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Tekbaev from Kyrgyzstan. Уважаемые дамы и господа, дорогие друзья, я хотел бы выразить слова искренней благодарности организаторам данного мероприятия за теплый прием и гостеприимство на благодатной македонской земле. Последние годы в Европе озабочена проблемами миграции. Из истории мы знаем, что в течение нескольких веков Европа подверглась как минимум два раза миграционному давлению извне. В четвертом и шестых веках произошло великое переселение народов на территории Римской империи, толчок которому дала движение племен гунов из Азии. Этот процесс способствовал крушению Римской империи, оказал большое влияние на формирование современной этнической карты Европы. Вторжение кочевников из Азии в Европу продолжалось до середины XIII века. Наиболее значительным из них было монголо-татарское нашествие под предводительством хана Батыя, потомка Чингисхана. Сегодня ученые установили, что первопричиной мощных глобальных миграционных процессов было изменение климата. Нарушился баланс естественной среды обитания народов. Они спасались от голода и смерти. И сегодня первопричиной массовой миграции в Европу народов стран Азии и Африки является нарушение стабильности среды обитания народов. Только, только на этот раз причина не климатическая, а рукотворная, политическая. И сегодня, и как, как и сотни лет назад, люди спасаются от голода и смерти. Последствия миграции масштабные. Она сильно изменила политический спектр Европы. Спектр продолжается перемешаться вправо. И это очень опасно. Уважаемые друзья, нужно бороться не только с последствиями, но и с причинами. Мы знаем, с какой целью создавался Европейский Союз. Это объединение европейских ресурсов для устойчивого развития стран Европы. Однако на сегодняшний день европейские места находятся под угрозой. Мы видим, что спад политического доверия наблюдается почти по всей Европе. А его причиной является не только экономический кризис, но и неудачная внешняя политика. Опросы общественного мнения показали резкое падение доверия к Евросоюзу в тех странах, которые традиционно выступали за общую Европу. Со стороны кажется, что Евросоюз утратил зримый и ясный ориентир развития. Есть ли смысл у европейской интеграции? Этот вопрос задают сейчас многие, и ответы, ответы на него неоднозначны. Но мы не можем отрицать, что Европейский Союз является мощным институтом, который может влиять на положение дел не только в странах Европы, но и в ситуации во всем мире. Здесь стоит ответить последствия так называемой «арабской весны». Весь мир следил, следил за этими событиями в надежде, что они приведут к формированию новых демократических стен. Теперь эта надежда сменила тревога и разочарование. Арабская весна не предложила ни одного положительного сценария. В отсутствии институциональной альтернативы авторитарным режимам их свершение привело к анархии и хаосу, росту влияния радикальных течений и сил. Мы видим, что стремление внедрить европейские стандарты демократии с помощью политических, экономических, военных методов со стороны Европейского Союза привели в данном случае абсолютно противоположным результатам. В результате вместо демократии, свободы, хаос, вспышка насилия, 
череда переворотов, безработицы, деградации общества. Исходя из этого, мы убеждены, что Евросоюз должен разработать более реальный внешнеполитический курс. Для этого Евросоюз должен привести реформы как у себя внутри, так и в отношениях со стратегическими партнерами. Пересмотреть ближневосточную, североафриканскую и украинскую политику ЕС. Минутку. Формирование внешнеполитической стратегии ЕС потребует, как показала арабская весна, переосмысление традиционных представлений о демократии, о поддержке демократических преобразований в разных регионах и, самое главное, определение баланса между политическим реализмом и ценностно ориентированной политикой. Спасибо за внимание. Because the translation from English is with uh, some noises on the earphones. I don't know what it is happening. Please, I think it's a technical problem. Thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to Mr. Beckervold from Norway. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to start by reminding ourselves of some of the wording in our Tbilisi declaration. We called on participating states to increase the support and protection to refugees and migrants aimed at better resp responsibility sharing and mutual soli solidarity. The countries in the OCE area are facing a challenging situation. The number of migrants and refugees is large and growing. Human rights principles in Europe are strained during this uh, unprecedented migration and re refugee flow. It is my impression that many of our countries are more focused on uh, border control rather than a fair sharing of responsibility for refugees, asylum seekers and other migrants. It is not fair to leave the Mediterranean countries to handle the mi mi migration challenges on their own. The need for a common response to the migration challenges is obvious. According to a new report by Amnesty International, over 12,500 people have arrived on the shores of Greece after the implementation of the EU-Turkey migration agreement. According to the European Commission's third progress report, the total number of migrants returned to Turkey following the agreement is 578. Some 50,000 asylum seekers and migrants remain stuck in Greece. Also, EU-led efforts to relocate people from Italy and Greece to other European states remain dismal. Only a small presence of people have so far been relocated. Some countries have relocated just a handful of people, some yet to relocate anyone. The need for emergency relocation from Greece and Italy is expected to remain high. Madam Chair, this is not just about numbers. In Tbilisi, we call for responsibility sharing and mutual solidarity. <coughs> When 50,000 human beings are stuck in an urgent humanitarian situation, we need to work together to alleviate that situation. Contribution in terms of funds or goods is all very well. But to me, responsibility sharing and mutual solidarity mean that we must take the relocation scheme work. That is the responsibility of all of our countries. Thank you. Thank you. And now Mrs. Vokomanovic from Serbia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, parliamentarians, I would like to share experience of my home country, Serbia, that has long-lasting experience in migrant and refugee crisis management up to now for 20 years. I would like also to say no? that our country, okay. Serbia, uh, 
Due to this experience and empathy uh, for migrants and refugees, uh, uh, was able to provide assistance to more than 700,000 of refugees and migrants who were transiting through Serbia in the last one and a half year. I would like also to use the opportunity to express our gratitude to the Minister of Interior, Mr. Spasovsky, for good cooperation between Serbian and Macedonian police. This is not just the lip service uh, to our host country who is doing and who has done a great job uh, with hospitality to all of us. That is also the fact that we have seen on the field because uh, a group of uh, OSC parliamentarians led by uh, Madam Chair Isabel Santos and my colleagues from Serbian Parliament has visited uh, uh, this registration point between Tabanovce and Miratovce, uh, the southern uh, border of Serbia near Preševo. So we could witness that with our eyes and now to speak about that loudly. So I will just shortly enumerate uh, what Serbia has organized uh, so far. Reception centers, accommodation, transport. We have also pro provided food, clothing, hair care, and special care for women, girls, and children, as well as for the elderly and sick persons, sick, pe uh, sick people, who are the most vulnerable. Serbia has already uh, donated 500,000 of euros to UNICEF for the education of children in Syria, and I think that is the best model how to prevent further migration to help people on the field uh, from the country uh, to the country of origin uh, uh, who, uh, uh, because people are suffering there a lot. Although the influx of refugees and migrants has somehow decreased since March of this year due to the suspension of Balkan Road, uh, we have noticed that uh, due to illegal involvement of criminal groups, the Western Balkan Road is far from close. For example, just to uh, mention the data, that uh, due to the joint efforts of police and uh, military forces in Serbia, the border between Serbia and Bulgaria have been successful uh, in uh, preventing approximately 9,000 of persons from illegal crossing of our borders. I'm speaking about uh, this period from March up to now. So we could implement these measures only in coordination with our neighboring countries. I have mentioned just two, Macedonia and Bulgaria, but there are lots of them also on the northern border in order to prevent activities of criminal smuggling groups. Last but not the least, uh, this day when Hungary is holding referenda on quota, I would like to emphasize the strong commitment on Serbia that Serbia will not build walls or fences and that we are ready to continue our cooperation to show solidarity and that Serbia will do its best to implement best practices in migrant crisis management. And I would like also to emphasize that all tools that we could use with this aim should be not only legal and workable, but also should Please be conclude. ethical. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'll give the floor to Mrs. Sena from Portugal. Thank you, dear Madam Chair, dear distinguished colleagues. Once again, I address to this assembly with the same theme, and it seems it will be so for a long time still. We leave our assemblies full of goodwill and good intentions, and then in our countries, even if we address the issue of the migrant crisis, it has proven not to be enough. We must all keep bringing the team once and once again. Our words must leave the paper and transform into actions in the field. We cannot allow ourselves to have a whole generation of children with no education because we are not able to first end the conflicts that made them leave their countries, second, to receive them in our countries in safety and offering them the most basic rights for education. What can we actually to do to make a difference? share responsibility and be solidary. 
share responsibility is talk about it in our countries, demystify the misperceptions, be solidarity. Be solidary is teaching also solidarity when it is necessary. Persist in this mission until necessary measures are taken. Children are the most affected by the migrant crisis and are growing in the camps with no conditions. They will be misused, abused, and eventually they will continue, continue to be victims of a world that seems to have no place for them. So it is true that we have few means, but we still have more than most. We have a voice, the voice they lack. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Kuzlova from Russia Federation. Global уважаемые. Коллеги, мы сегодня собрались для решения очень важных проблем и прежде всего для того, чтобы разобраться в таком негативном процессе, который осложняет жизнь и, как совершенно правильно сказала председатель госпожа Изабель Санташ, безопасность во многих странах. Это миграция. В последнее время мы много говорим о проблемах беженцев и мигрантов. Уже немало сделано для управления миграцией. И, как сказал господин Оливер Спасовский, но тем не менее проблема остается. И это свидетельствует о необходимости анализа причин такой глобальной проблемы. Одной из основных причин нежелательной миграции, на мой взгляд, является вмешательство известных стран во внутреннюю политику суверенных государств. И только потому, что во главе стояли неуправляемые ими главы государств. И провозглашая на словах приверженность демократии, как делают некоторые, на деле поступили абсолютно недемократично и жестоко устранили неугодных руководителей, лишив жизни варварскими методами. Это и привело к дестабилизации, к конфликтам на межнациональной почве, гражданской войне, гибели людей, в том числе детей и женщин, и потоку беженцев в другие страны в поисках стабильности и мирной жизни, которую они потеряли. Но почему мы об этом не говорим? Почему не расследуем эти преступления и не называем тех, по чьей вине это произошло? Где наши осуждающие резолюции? А теперь я не выступала предыдущие дни, но сегодня хочу ответить на ежедневные потоки лжи по поводу Крыма. Хочу напомнить всем, что начались проблемы в Украине еще задолго до Крыма, тогда, когда Крым входил в состав Украины. И начались они с государственного переворота и свержения законного главы страны. И, конечно, этот переворот не организован, как вы понимаете, Россией. Далее, вы прекрасно знаете, что никакого военного вторжения России в Крым не было. Было референдум, было обращение правительства Крыма к президенту России, было одобрение решения президента парламентом России. Подтверждают добровольное вхождение Крым в Россию, подтверждением этого явилось и то, что в это время не пролилась кровь людей. Ответьте, когда и где военное вторжение не сопровождалось кровопролитием и гибелью людей? И последний вопрос. Почему при обсуждении любого вопроса Начинается литье потока грязи на России. Удивительно, что это делают даже те, кто не был ни в Крыму, ни в Севастополе, и говорит со слов тех, кто вместо наведения порядка в своей стране делает все, чтобы вызвать негативные отношения к России. Я понимаю, что таким людям не нравится Россия, не нравится, что несмотря на санкции и имеющиеся проблемы, Россия развивается и, могу заверить, будет развиваться. Но я уверена, что профессионализм политиков поможет всем подняться выше личной неприязни к России и взглянуть на происходящее объективно. В заключение я хотела бы поблагодарить парламентариев ОБСЕ за совместную работу и очень надеюсь, что сегодня вы меня не только слушали, но и услышали. Спасибо. Thank you, Mr. Gagamian from Armenia. Уважаемые коллеги, вопросы улучшения управления миграцией для армян имеют жизненно важное значение в силу исторических причин, трагических страниц нашей истории, так и в связи с трагедией, разыгравшейся в Сирии и ставшей причиной гибели многих и многих армян 
и 20 тысяч сирийских беженцев армян. Что имеется в виду под исторической трагедией? Это прежде всего геноцид армян, учиненный в Османской империи. Далее эта трагедия повторилась спустя 70 лет уже в Азербайджане. Она началась с сумгаитской резней и сожжением армян, была продолжена бакинскими погромами. Чтобы не быть голословным, я приведу пример докладчика очень уважаемой авторитетной международной организации, какой, каковой является Human Rights Watch. Что пишет докладчик Роберт Кушен? Армянские погромы в Баку – это были беспорядки на этнической почве, сопровождавшиеся насилием в отношении армянского населения, грабежами, убийствами, поджогами и уничтожением имущества. Жертвами погромов стали от 90 до 300 человек. Далее Роберт Кушен подчеркивает – Погромы не были полностью стихийными, так как погромщики имели списки и адреса армян. Далее волна насилия прокатилась по всему Азербайджану в тех районах, где компактно проживали армяне. Спустя после этих трагических событий более 500 тысяч армян, повторяю, более 500 тысяч армян, проживающих в Азербайджане, спасались бегством, прежде всего в Армению и в Россию, а также в страны Европы. Здесь вчера коллега говорил о том, что в Краснодарском крае, в Ростовской области очень много армян, и они требуют автономии. Нет, они требуют справедливости, но не от российских властей, которые их приютили, а от международного сообщества, которые оставили без должного реагирования новую резню и геноцид, учиненный азербайджанскими властями. В силу этого сейчас Армения, принимая 20 тысяч своих беженцев, сирийских армян. Я повторюсь, на 150 жителей Армении приходится один беженец, в то время как в Евросоюзе от 400 до 450 жителей приходится один беженец. Мы просим прежде всего установления справедливости в вопросах соблюдения прав беженцев. И беженцев составляющих более миллиона армян, я имею в виду полумиллиона армян, которые, повторяю, стали беженцами вследствие геноцидальной политики азербайджанских властей. Думаю, что сегодняшнее обсуждение явится началом справедливого рассмотрения всех проблем, связанных с беженцами. И сегодня беженец стучится в дома каждого из нас. И вспомним, какие выдающиеся таланты дали беженцы нашему миру. Одних только армян не перечесть. Анри Верной, Шарль Азнаур, Док, Док Меджан, Кер Кер Корян. Жорж Гарваренц, Мишель Легран. Можно этот список до конца сегодняшнего заседания зачитать. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you. I love Charles Navour. Mr. Gulbenkian is a very important reference in my country. Uh, but I would like more listen you talking about general issue that we are discussing now. Uh, for the next time, maybe you will focus more on the, the theme of discussion. Mr. Hadjiani from Cyprus, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. So, migration flows continue to be met with growing warnings or resistance by sections of public opinion in the OSC area. The perceived association of terrorists with migration has greatly exacerbated the securitization of the debate to the expense of the genuine human rights-based approach. I believe that it is in fact a human rights-centered approach that will yield durable results both regarding migration management as well as eternal security of our countries. Reports confirm me that migrants face different type of problems which are a source of great concern. We must acknowledge that migrants have rights which need to be respected. A human rights-based 
governance includes protection of displaced persons and asylum seekers, their integration into the host society, as well as the prevention of human trafficking networks operation along migration routes. OSC broad membership is an asset in this respect as it provides the possibility to engage origin, transit, and destination countries. We have heard the initiatives taken at the governmental level of the OSC structures. As a parliamentary assembly, we can and must contribute in the effort to deliver a coherent policy for the OSC area. It is evident that more focus action, including specific country advisory and support visits to promote tailored policy making and institutional capacity building are urgently needed. At the same time that we are still discussing ways to establish a human rights based governance concerning migration, countries such as Jordan have exerted enormous effort since the onset of the Syrian crisis, while unfortunately it has not occupied center stage in our debates like other countries have. And genuine human rights based approach need to share their responsibility on a global scale. In an area where the human rights were not respected is the Cyprus conflict. It is positive progress which take place on the negotiation table for the Cyprus conflict. Four of the six chapters are almost positive close, near to solve differences with convergence. The four chapters are related with the governmental system in which the human rights of Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriots will be implemented, applied, and respected. They are remaining open to vital chapters, the military presence of Turkey and the guarantee system, which are not acceptable, also the territorial issue. These two remain chapters are issues of Turkey and only Turkey. Greece and UK are prepared to give up their guarantee rights. I call Turkey to, to do the same. One state who is member of EU doesn't need guarantors with inv invasion rights. We are a small country of almost a million people. Turkey, you are not afraid of us, but we are afraid of you. Therefore, as our president from Udone yesterday said, we must engage with each other and search for common ground. We must widen our perspective and see the world not only from our nation, national point of view, but also through the eyes of our Please neighbors, conclude. partner, and even opponents. This is how we build confidence and ultimately replace the threat of conflict with long-term stability. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Miss, uh, Mrs. Susanna Amador, the floor is yours. Good morning to you all, dear colleagues. Mrs. Isabel Santos, many thanks for the expositions of this morning, excellent expositions. Dear colleagues, the European identity is based on a project of well-being, tolerance, solidarity and safety of European people based on three main pillars, representative democracy, the guarantee of rights and fundamental freedoms and good governance. Through these pillars we achieve the principle of popular sovereignty, political participation, freedom of expression and religion, equality, rule of law, separation of powers, transparency and parliament control. All these principles sustain liberal democracies. The respect for human rights and human dignity is the base of Article 2nd A of European Union Treaty. This means that international migration, we must accomplish all these values, also inscribed on the Geneva Convention, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and European Convention on Human Rights. To approach this migration crisis, we must be more Europe, not less Europe more integration and common strategy, more solidarity, more burden sharing, more dialogue and cooperation, more development, which is the new name of peace. We all know that durable solutions for refugees and the prevention of conflicts by increasing dialogue and cooperation are vital to build a new era, a new hope for Europe. Only with democratic institutions and good practice of governance, we can go ahead, we can go further and be more Europe. The arrival to Europe of refugees since the immigration crisis increase rarely meant the end of suffering of those who survive. Sexual abuses, human trafficking, 
and all sorts of human rights violations occurred at the crossing and within the refugee camps in the earth of Europe and must, must be stopped. The registration on hot spots and the huge insecurity at refugee camps, the lack of medical assistance and access to education need to be changed urgently with safe and accelerated procedures and safeguards bearing in mind fast replacement and reinstallation of refugees on safe countries of destination such as Portugal. We are able to receive 10,000 people. They need a new start with stability and with some future ahead. Camps must be a transitory situation. The fight against misinformation about refugees and the xenophobe speech must be also in our agenda as underlined by the Economical and Social European Commission Report 2016. Dear colleagues, we need a true and effective common asylum system and equitative distribution of refugees as well as safe routes for the entry of refugees in Europe. The main question is, are we all doing what we must do? More than 16 million refugees in 2015 suffered and fled from persecution, dictatorial regimes, armed conflicts, terrorism on their origin countries. They can't suffer again at Europe's doors, but they are suffering on a daily basis, and women and children are the, main, the most affected, and they are victims twice. For conclusion... Please conclude. The respect for human rights and for women's rights in particular is the main instrument for peace, security and development. Education and access to education will always be the key and the beginning of all changes. The right to have rights, as Anna Arendt said, is still our goal and permanent agenda here in OSCE. Keep going. Thank you. Mrs. Deskoska from Macedonia. Thank you, Madam Santos. Napliwot na begalci, na granicite na prva ta linija na evropska ta granica, pokaža praktično dve raboti. Prva ta je deka samo so zajednička i koheretna politika možeme uspešno da odgovorime na predizvicite. No isto taka, prvi odbran na begalci gi izvadi na površina i slabostite na odredeni međunarodni zajednici i organizaciji. Republika Makedonija se najde v uloga na čuvar na granicite na Evropska ta unija od ilegalna migracija koja što dojadjaše od zemja členka na Evropska ta unija. Moja ta ocenka je, da Republika Makedonija uspešno go napravi toa. Republika Makedonija pristapi so golema serioznost i so iskrena posvetenost v srešavanje na novo nastanatata situacija. Sobranje to na Republika Makedonija, ki donese potrebnite zakonski izmeni, na teren kontinuirano se vložuva maksimalni napori v prifat na migranti na makedonsko-grčkata granica, nivno so odvetno zgrižuvanje i transport do makedonsko-srpskata granica, Soglasno međunarodnite dokumenti Republika Makedonija vrši rano identifikovanje na onije lica na koji što im je potrebna zaštita, na ranljivite grupi, na ženite i decata. Jaz go delam mislenjeto, da gradenje tudi zidovi ne je rešenje na begalskata kriza. Nije kako državi, koji što sme na patot na begalskata ruta, imame obvrska, da obezbedime osnovni čovečki životni uslovi v privatnite centri, zaštita od trgovcite soluge in predse zaštita na čovečkoto dostojnstvo na begalcite. Od druga strana, in međunarodnata zajednica ima svoje obvrski. Za uspešno spravovanje so begalskata kriza potreben je koherenten, konzistenten in predse koordiniran pristap na državite zasegnati od migracijata, na međunarodnite organizaciji i zajednici, kako što so objedinetite naciji, Evropska ta unija, OPSE in Sovetot na Evropa. Samo zajedno možeme, da rešime krizata, so koja što sme soočeni. Vi blagodaram. Thank you. Mr. Cikilio from Spain, floor is yours. Gracias, senjora presidenta, estimados colegas, y oradores que han, nos han ilustrado 
en su primera intervención. El pasado 19 de septiembre se aprobó la denominada Declaración de Nueva York, como muy bien ha explicado el señor Rocco, referida a un primer paso desde la comunidad internacional para abordar la crisis migratoria y de refugiados. Como actor principal, que entiendo que es la hoste, desde España valor, valoraríamos muy positivamente que nuestra organización, con demostrada experiencia sobre el terreno, posición privilegiada y de proximidad, tiene que desempeñar un papel clave en la negociación de los pactos globales sobre migraciones y refugiados que se contemplan en la Declaración de Nueva York y que prevé que se adopten esos acuerdos en 2018. No hay tiempo que perder. Yo animo al señor Lombardi, le animamos en su trabajo, esfuerzo y dedicación para que desde un enfoque humano, con medidas eficaces que aseguren una acogida digna a los refugiados en los países de destino, educación, trabajo digno, derechos humanos y solidaridad, propongamos, seamos capaces de proponer desde la OSTE iniciativas ambiciosas y que la Comisión de Migraciones, que dirige nuestro compañero Lombardi, eh, actúe y que la Comisión de Migraciones de la OSTE participe activamente en el diseño de la política de migraciones y de refugiados dirigida, según la ACNUR, a más de 65 millones de seres humanos. Seres humanos que nos piden que pasemos de las palabras a la acción y de las buenas palabras a los compromisos y a la solidaridad. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Mr. Divina, from Italy, the floor is yours. Grazie, Presidente. Ma abbiamo sentito tanti interventi interessanti e nobili dichiarazioni di intenti, però si continua sulla grande confusione e nel non distinguere immigrati da rifugiati. Tutti i paesi della comunità Europa e dell'Europa intera sono, beh, dal 2008 stanno passando grosse crisi e sono tutti impegnati nel rivedere le proprie politiche di bilancio. Tutti i cittadini europei si sentono più impoveriti rispetto al passato e temono ancora di più questa situazione di impoverimento. I Paesi stanno affrontando tutti norme straordinarie sul rilancio dell'occupazione e sulle politiche del lavoro, che è sempre più scarso. I cittadini reagiscono a questi fenomeni e lo abbiamo anche capito. Basta vedere ciò che è già accaduto con il referendum in Svizzera e quello che è pronosticato per il referendum che si sta svolgendo proprio oggi in Ungheria. Questo è quello che pensano i nostri cittadini e questo è quello che noi non possiamo non considerare. Infatti si alzano muri in Europa un po' dappertutto. Bene, se noi potessimo selezionare questi flussi, distinguere chi fugge da pericoli, chi fugge da guerre e così via, da chi no, Beh, intanto avremmo già dei numeri sicuramente più gestibili e anche più accettabili da tutti i nostri cittadini. Infatti è nei paesi di partenza di questi flussi che si risolve il grosso della situazione. Fermare questo fenomeno è un po' come pensare di fermare il vento con le mani. Noi dobbiamo fermare le cause di questo vento e l'unica cosa che riusciamo oggettivamente a fare sarebbe uno sforzo economico ma di tutti i paesi, di tutti i paesi europei, ma uno sforzo vero, è uno sforzo sufficiente, cioè adeguato, perché le politiche della cooperazione sono cosa minimale oggi. Questi flussi indirizzati nelle aree 
diciamo, di crisi umane, dove c'è carenza di acqua, dove c'è fame, dove non c'è economia locale, da dove sostanzialmente si scappa. Bene, se noi riusciamo a creare un po' di implemento di sviluppo economico, beh, questo sarebbe l'unico fattore che potrebbe, e anche il più importante, che potrebbe contenere questi, e ho finito, questi flussi e sarebbero tra il resto l'unico modo effettivamente gestibile da noi questo fenomeno di migrazione. Grazie Presidente. Thank you. Mr. Cruznier from Belgium, the floor is yours. Merci Madame la Presidente, chers collègues. La crise des migrants nous a évidemment tous touchés, nous sommes tous concernés. La question de l'immigration est, est récurrente, mais elle a pris une dimension nouvelle ces derniers mois. Dans un premier temps, la réponse à cette crise migratoire n'a été que trop sécuritaire, voire même uniquement sécuritaire. Des frontières se sont refermées, des murs se sont créés, et dans le même temps, des camps de réfugiés se construisaient dans des conditions inacceptables, même inhumaines, devrais-je dire. Nous avons tous une responsabilité en la matière. Il faut lutter contre les causes de cette migration. Et je pense bien évidemment à la lutte contre Daesh et mon pays y prend part de façon active. Mais nous devons aussi développer nos politiques de coopération au développement au profit des pays qui sont à la source de ces migrations. Malheureusement, cette réflexion vient bien souvent après l'aspect sécuritaire. Ce sont des hypocrites À l'heure actuelle, chacun regarde dans son microcosme et tente de rejeter le problème sur les pays voisins. Nous sommes de plus en plus égoïstes. Face à la question de la migration, l'Europe actuelle souffre d'être la somme des politiques étrangères des différents États qui la composent, laissant peu de place au compromis et peu de marche d'action à des institutions prises en otage par les différents points de vue des États membres. Aujourd'hui, malheureusement, L'Union européenne n'est que la somme de 28 visions nationales. Alors que justement, l'Europe devrait agir et parler d'une seule voix, celle des Européens, elle est tiraillée par des intérêts nationaux et politiques qui rendent les institutions européennes inefficaces. Au lieu de penser en termes de « nous », les Européens pensent en termes de « je » et affectent grandement son fonctionnement. C'est cela que nous devons changer. Pour conclure, Madame la Présidente, chaque femme, Chaque homme, où qu'il naisse, est porteur de droits universels. Que chacun puisse en jouir et les garder doit être notre priorité, quelle que soit sa situation, quelles que soient ses convictions. Telle doit être notre ambition et notre engagement commun. Le respect des droits de l'homme, de l'état de droit et de la démocratie ne doit souffrir d'aucune exception, d'aucun accommodement, d'aucun renoncement. En tant que démocrate et représentant des peuples, c'est là notre responsabilité d'élu. Je vous remercie. Mr. Berthold from Canada. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Permettez-moi d'abord, Madame la Présidente, de féliciter le personnel de l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OSCE pour l'organisation de cette session et, au nom de la délégation canadienne, de remercier nos hôtes, la République de Macédoine, pour l'excellent accueil que nous avons reçu à Skopje. Je me ferai un plaisir d'être un ambassadeur de la Macédoine à mon retour au Canada. Depuis le début de nos travaux, nous avons abordé sous divers angles les différentes façons de renforcer la confiance et d'améliorer la gouvernance dans la zone de l'OSCE. Selon moi, la base de toutes les mesures, de toutes nos actions et l'essence même de notre existence comme parlementaires, ce qui doit toujours guider nos échanges, ce sont les hommes et les femmes que nous représentons, celles et ceux qui nous accordent leur confiance ou nous la retirent lors de l'exercice de leur droit fondamental de s'exprimer lors d'élections démocratiques. Je comprends que la situation canadienne est très différente de la situation migratoire qui existe ici dans les Balkans. Le flux de migrants et de réfugiés est tellement important qu'il existe un risque réel de déstabilisation sociale et économique dans certains pays de l'OSCE et il met en péril, comme on l'a constaté, la coopération entre nos nations. Je crois, comme plusieurs délégués ici, que la crise actuelle est un problème mondial qui nous concerne tous. J'aimerais aborder la question de l'intolérance, qui est l'un des effets collatéraux de cet afflux de personnes qui cherchent, d'abord et avant tout, à améliorer leur situation personnelle, familiale, en fuyant la pauvreté ou la guerre. 
Nous, les parlementaires, sommes le dernier rempart des migrants contre l'intolérance et je crois qu'un danger nous guette. Il est à nos portes. Nous, les parlementaires, sommes soumis à des élections et beaucoup seront tentés de tomber dans le piège du populisme. Ce populisme nourri par l'attrait du pouvoir ou de l'élection facile, ce populisme qui nourrit l'intolérance, isole les individus, suscite la radicalisation et amène à l'extrémisme. Que pouvons-nous faire comme parlementaires pour lutter contre la radicalisation et l'extrémisme? Mieux connaître les causes profondes du terrorisme dans le but de créer des solutions politiques qui empêchent les individus de succomber à des idéologies dangereuses. Nous devons travailler à mettre en œuvre des lois qui répondent à la pauvreté, à l'instabilité, à la corruption, au système du deux poids deux mesures, à la frustration, à la discrimination raciale et sexuelle et aux injustices perçues. Madame la Présidente, les parlementaires peuvent contribuer dans leur législature et à l'extérieur de leur législature. Nous pouvons affirmer que la voix des parlementaires est notre outil le plus puissant. Nous jouons un rôle clé dans l'élaboration de l'opinion publique et nous pouvons contribuer au débat par l'intermédiaire d'une variété de forums publics. Chers collègues, en terminant, je vous invite à utiliser votre voix pour dénoncer l'intolérance au sein des collectivités pour que les individus visés comprennent que leur vision des choses n'est pas celle de nos communautés. Faisons ensemble la promotion de la tolérance et travaillons à favoriser un sentiment de communauté pour éviter que certaines personnes ne se sentent marginalisées ou isolées, ne se radicalisent et ne deviennent des ennemis de nos communautés par notre propre insouciance. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Thank you. Mr. Zopardi from Malta, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. While dealing with the migration issue, it becomes increasingly clear to us that as a lack of human rights-based systems of migration, governance at regional and national level is creating a human rights crisis for migrants at borders and in the territory of countries of transit and destination. Migrants, notably those in, in an irregular situation, tend to live and work in the shadows, afraid of, to complain. Denied rights and freedom of disproportionality, vulnerable to discrimination, exploitation and marginalization. Human rights vi violations against mig migrants, including denial of access to fundamental rights, such as the right to education and the right to, the, to health, are often closely linked to discriminatory laws, practices, and to deep-seated attitudes of prejudice and xenophobia against migrants. As a democratic organization, We all believe that migrants' rights are human rights, as embedded in the Convention to, for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, and the number of European Union regulations and frameworks that uh, uphold human rights. Our immediate and very urgent challenge is to deliver on these goals. For the sake of these people, we need to make a firm commitment to walk the talk and to transform words into immediate and concrete actions. We need to deliberate how people in peril, whether as a result of war, terrorism or climate change, can be protected and their human rights upheld. We need to think and plan on the long longer term so that future generations are spared similar tra tragedies and the loss of life is transformed into respect for diversity and inclusion at all levels. While one acknowledges the difficulties in realizing these goals and targets, we have to dream and have the confidence that they are reachable. While, ma while making a firm commitment to act. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now, Mrs. Fry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, um, I, 
I wanted to thank the Macedonian government and its people for their very warm welcome. Uh, we really have enjoyed our stay here. Uh, and I am also want to thank uh, Mr. Lombardi, my colleague, for in fact accepting that we need to look at women and girls as very vulnerable populations. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the problem and the shared responsibility for this issue. This is a permanent problem. It has been with us from the beginning of time and it will continue to be with us. In fact, we will find that refugee and migrant crises will become even greater as the years go by. So this is a shared global responsibility, not only a shared Balkan and European responsibility. So we need to all share this burden. And I, I want you to know that Canada co-chaired the United Nations conference two weeks ago with regard to looking at a global plan to do this. Most people believe that Canada has never had people arrive on its shores and don't know what it feels like to be in Europe or the Balkans. But that actually is not quite true. Canada took its share of refugees during the First World War, Second World War, but it was in the Vietnamese War that we actually saw boatloads of people arrive on our shores in 1979. And because we believe that there must be um, a managed, uh, ish, managed solution to this problem, we created a new act that allowed for the Indo-Chinese people to come. They came in boats, we call them the boat people. And as a result of that, we have learned some very important things about accepting migrants. We found that in fact, we de have decided that the government alone must not sponsor migrants. We now have churches and communities and villages sponsoring migrants. Uh, the 26,000 that we took from, uh, from Syria are actually, many of them are special needs families. They have disabled persons in their families. They have mental illness in their families. And we decided to take these people. But communities came together and privately put money together to sponsor them. Integration is key. We learned from the Vietnamese boat people that, in fact, integration is a benefit to the country. We took 103,000 people in 1979 and 1980 during the Vietnamese boat people arriving on the shores of Canada. And we have now looked at the generation that came from those groups. They have integrated fully. They are, they are actually a benefit to our country in terms of economic, social, and political development. They have actually made Canada a better place because of that 103,000 people that we took. So let us not just look at this narrowly. Let's look at the benefits of taking this burden and sharing it because this is a global crisis. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Parni from Malta. Thanks very much. Welcome and thanks. Today is a priority to put in our agendas the importance of human rights visas vis-à-vis -vis the immigration. I believe that the issue of migration is not a problem, but it is a challenge. I agree with the motto of making migration for the benefit of all. I agree the importance of the integration with these people. This is a must. We need to be solidarity with this country. I appreciate the effort of the European Union and OSCE and others, but we need to do more. There are two challenges, the emigrant itself and the country itself that regularly number of immigrants enter in our countries. The question is, why do people emigrate? The effort of the emigration. Worldwide, there is an estimate that 191 million emigrates at the last 50 years. There are 150 million emigrates live in developed countries and 33% of all immigrants live in Europe, and 75% live in just 28 countries. This is not only a challenge for our countries, but for the immigrants itself. My points, immigrants will often do jobs that people in host country will not or cannot do. Migrant workers often work longer hours and for lower salaries. The dignity in camps for the emigrants. The regular deaths in Mediterranean Sea. The rights for the 
on board child and the rights for children. Malta was in front of this right. In fact, of this issue, I believe the key for this challenge is to work together. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Gossier from Turkey. Madam Chair and dear colleagues, to really grasp the humanitarian aspect of migration, we should try to fully empathize with that it feels like to have to leave your city, your routine, etc. To leave what you made and your memories to start anew in a foreign country in a new language, or to have to stay behind where it is no longer safe and secure and nothing is the same. Disturbing, even to emphasize. However, even more disturbing, I suppose, is to emphasize with being a child during such conflicts. Children need to feel safe and secure in their small worlds, loved and protected by their families, have access to decent schooling, dreaming, playing, the lightness of being a child. When a million of children are going through such times, then the international community also has a responsibility to oversee their protection, to provide means and tools for their education, to take care of unaccompanied, and so on, as these children also risk becoming a lost generation. Shakespeare says to be or not to be. This is the question. In this issue, we say to do or not to do. This is the issue. Turkey is home to more than 2.7 million Syrians. This makes us the largest refugee hosting country in the world, according to UNHCR. With this figure, we are the country contributing the highest percentage of national budget to the needs of refugees. I would like to call on all the participants in this room to be more attentive to the humanitarian dimension of migration in a spirit of responsibility sharing. Based on some remarks made by Mr. Lombardi today, I would like to emphasize that radicalization is radicalization. It cannot be associated with any religion. Doing so would be more counterproductive. Priority should be given to integration policies which specifically address the problem of exclusion and victimization. We observe that the recent refugee flow to Europe has further increased xenophobic and Islamophobic tendencies in European countries, with, with Muslim migrants bearing the brunt of these reprehensible attitudes. The extent and severity of this phenomenon has become increasingly evident in the reports of mistreatment and racially motivated acts toward migrants. On the other hand, Hate crimes and dramatically underreported, not least because many victims have a deep seated lack of trust in the authorities. Such sentiments are generally fueled by populist rhetoric of the extremist parties and biased media portraits, which represent a huge challenge to the European democracies. The media and politicians may play a determining role in the direct the societies in a responsible manner on this issue. This is a problem that requires special attention. As the statement by Mr. Hajiani. Please conclude. Turkey fully supports UN negotiation for a comprehensive settlement of Cyprus, a big communal, bizonal federation based on political inequality between Turkish and Greek Cypriots. If Annan plan was not rejected by the Greek Cypriot people in 2004, 
the Turkish forces would have been reduced through a calendar together with Greek forces. And for concerning the allegations of our Armenian colleague, we regret that our valuable time is once again used for Please such conclude. allegations. Our Joint History Commission is still on the table. We hope Armenians will leave their one-sided rhetoric and join in our quest for truth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Gonzalez from Spain. Muchas gracias, eh, señora presidenta. Gracias a Macedonia por acogernos, queridos colegas. En todas las reuniones de la OCE dedicamos muchos esfuerzos y mucho tiempo en debatir sobre la migración. Prueba de ello es esta reunión en la que aprovecho para felicitar a la señora Isabel Santos y a todos los conferenciantes por el magnífico desarrollo y por la participación que tiene. Pero, ¿de qué nos sirve debatir, debatir, debatir sobre este drama humano y las causas que lo producen si no somos capaces de avanzar en soluciones. Concluimos esta asamblea y voy a ser reiterativo. No regresaría tranquilo a mi país si no insistiera en algo que creo está en la mente de todos. Hace un año se acordó repartir 160.000 asilados para hacer frente a la crisis de refugiados. Un año después el reparto es residual. Es cierto que durante este verano se ha avanzado, pero sigue siendo residual. De los 160.000 asilados que pactaron los gobernantes para repartir en dos años, solo ha llegado a cabo un 3,5%. Se recela de la acogida y no se afrontan los compromisos y eso pone en cuestión la solidaridad comprometida. Hay países que no han recibido a ningún refugiado de los comprometidos. Hay países que incluso desafiando, desafían la autoridad de reparto. Ante esta situación tenemos que elevar la voz. No solo hay que mostrar solidaridad, hay que demostrar con hechos que somos solidarios. En el foro del Mediterráneo que celebramos el viernes quedó claro y hay que eh, concluir que la hipocresía y la Hay que afrontar, hay que acabar con la, la hipocresía y afrontar la responsabilidad. Fueron palabras de nuestra colega italiana Marietta Tidei, a la que me adhiero y felicito por su intervención. Si los comprometidos a actuar no lo hacen, ¿para qué sirve este debate si no somos capaces de influir en ello? Animo, pues, a que seamos más enérgicos en la demanda de soluciones basadas en derechos humanos en los países de origen, de tránsito y de destino. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Mr. Navizade from Azerbaijan. Уважаемый председатель, уважаемые коллеги, сегодня миграционный вопрос становится очень актуальным и тем самым актуализирует вопрос того, как управлять миграционными проблемами и процессами. Азербайджан не понаслышке знает, что такое миграционный поток. В результате оккупации Армении части территории Азербайджана наша страна приняла и в течение 25 лет практически в одиночку обустроила более 1 миллиона беженцев. И это не каждый 150-й житель, как в Армении, а каждый девятый житель Азербайджана – это беженец. Это очень большая цифра. Кстати, не хотелось отвечать на необоснованные популистские выступления армянской делегации, но хотелось бы напомнить истину, что предвестником сумгаитских событий 1988 года были резня и выселение азербайджанского населения в армянском городе Кафан. Эти скафанские события, когда убивали мирных азербайджанцев, и стали предвестником и началом Карабахского конфликта, и стали поводом для организации событий в Сумгаите. Самое интересное, что организатором сумгаитских событий был армянин по национальности Эдуард Григорян, что подтверждается его показаниями в Генпрокуратуре Азербайджана и СССР. Очень странно слышать такие выступления, далекие от темы дискуссии, от представителя страны, президент которой в интервью голландскому журналисту Томасу Девалу сам признался в том, что руководство Армении 
бывшая в то время в зоне боевых действий в Карабахе, целенаправленно и преднамеренно убила 613 человек, мирных людей в селе Ходжалы. Геноцид в Ходжалы это полностью лежит на это вина людей, которые сегодня стоят у руководства Армении. И хотелось бы сказать еще одну вещь. Значит, говорилось о беженцах в Сирии. 20 тысяч беженцев из Сирии сегодня незаконно размещены на оккупированных Арменией территориях. Все эти, в этих случаях речь идет о людях, ставших мигрантами в результате войны и агрессии. Устранение в будущем причин, ведущих к кризисным ситуациям, и есть основной залог уменьшения миграционного потока этой категории людей. Но, возвращаясь к теме дискуссии, я хотел бы затронуть, что мы упускаем несколько другую категорию людей, а именно трудовую миграцию, и, либо так называемую интеллектуальную Миграцию. В данном случае речь идет о том, что отток умов в развитые страны из развивающих стран приносит огромные убытки странам экспортеров интеллекта, снижает их научно-технический потенциал и тормозит развитие национальных экономик. Тем самым снижается качество жизни в этих странах. И это в будущем создает угрозу для возникновения кризисных политических ситуаций в этих развивающих странах что в свою очередь может повлечь за собой более масштабную миграцию из этих стран. Please Таким образом, conclude. представляется, что эффективное управление миграционными процессами должно означать не только выработку рецептов регулирования текущих миграционных процессов, но и выяснение последующих устранения причин, ведущих к увеличению всех э, миграционных потоков, всех категорий миграционных потоков. Спасибо большое за внимание. Thank you. Mrs. Eriksson from Norway, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank to the speakers for their keynote introductions. Dealing with migration is for sure difficult and complex. That makes it necessary to cooperate more in solving the different aspects of this challenge. One aspect is protecting of women and girls. Mr. Lombardi mentioned the gender perspective and was clear. We do not succeed in fulfilling our commitment for women and children. I want to raise the awareness regarding women's situation in migration and our responsibility for hindering exploitation by civil servants in European countries. UN Resolution 1531 guarantees that women in migration and living in refugee camps should be protected from sexual harassment, violence and rape. A report from Amnesty International from last year gives us important knowledge. They identified women exploited from civil servants in terms of sexual harassment, violence and exploitation. We have to address this serious violation on the security for women and girls. This has to stop. Minister Spasovsky mentioned the need for education of border controllers. I hope that every country include our common responsibilities for hindering such criminality. Towards women and girls, and that is making that to, uh, this criminality towards women and girls, that is making clear that such violations will be investigated and punished. We, the parliamentarians and leaders in the administrative levels, need also to stress this. We cannot accept that any civil servants in our countries exploit, threaten, or harass women and children, or use any kind of violence in the meeting with female migrants. To raise this in our parliaments and raise the question in USAE dialogues can be two of our concrete common commitments from this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Campania from Italy. Grazie, Presidente. Ma riprendendo quest'ultimo argomento della collega norvegese, ricordo che stamattina a un certo punto l'amico Lombardi ci ha dato una considerazione impressionante. Ha detto che all'ingrosso circa la metà delle donne e delle bambine che hanno affrontato questi viaggi della speranza o della disperazione 
è stata violentata durante il viaggio. Se è così, io non mi domando tanto di portare al futuro una buona educazione della polizia frontaliera. Io mi domando che cosa ha fatto la magistratura degli stati nazionali per reprimere comportamenti come questi che oltre che violazione della questione di genere, oltre che violazione di human right, sono degli odiosi crimini. Parlo anche a nome del mio paese dove c'è un esercizio dell'azione penale molto spesso interventista, ma in questi casi assolutamente inesistente. Non se ne è avuta notizia. E allora vengo ad un'altra considerazione che ha fatto l'amico Lombardi. Esiste un business, un business malavitoso della cosiddetta emigrazione e questo business ha radice tanto negli stati di partenza quanto, ahimè, negli stati di accoglienza, perché se è vero che certi comportamenti di malaffare incrementano business malavitosi negli hotspots e anche qui lo dico con molto dolore, parlo anche del mio paese, è anche vero che allora la questione ha un profilo internazionale meno generico, forse anche meno generoso, di quelle ottime dichiarazioni di New York del 19 settembre scorso o anche della nostra assemblea di Tbilisi nel mese di luglio. Ci sono responsabilità degli stati nazionali che non possono ridursi a un generico appello di solidarietà in nome dell'accoglienza, tanto più che dietro la questione che noi chiamiamo dei migranti c'è una drammatica questione di dissoluzione dello Stato nazionale in molti paesi del Mediterraneo. Dico la Siria, ma non voglio parlare specificamente della questione siriana. È chiaro che molti stati nazionali costruiti cento anni fa, dopo la prima guerra mondiale, sono state costruzioni superficiali, retoriche, che non hanno retto l'impatto con la realtà dei fatti. Grazie Presidente. Grazie. Mr. Steven from Netherlands. Thank you, uh, Chair. Also thanks to the Macedonian government and our colleagues for organizing this, also this part of the discussion. Uh, the Dutch delegation thinks that uh, burden, uh, the burden of migration is a uh, shared responsibility. First of all, we have to understand that migration is not a solution to solve problems. Migration is the source of a lot of problems in our countries. Migration is a problem, we can't solve it on our own. It has a lot of negative impacts in all our countries. And all the countries of the OSU have to organize an honest part to solve the problem. And in our opinion is that not sending vessels to the Mediterranean Sea to bring people from Africa to Europe, but the solution is finding and organizing better circumstances of the life in Asia and Africa. Share, we schaffen das nicht when we do it in the direct, same way we're walking now. And the Dutch delegation today was amazed to hear that we should make, uh, should, we should make the routes more secure, so as Mr. Lombardi said. I will say to Mr. Lombardi, I think that we don't have to support the routes, but support the solutions in the countries of origin. The Netherlands asked special attention for people who are suspected to have committed war crimes and who are involved in human trafficking. These people have to be, to be brought to justice. Mr. Chair, I come to conclusions. We don't agree with the Portuguese delegation who says more integration will be the solution. We think solidarity has to be showed in the countries of origin by all our members. And we fully agree with the Italian, Italian delegation 
that we have to make difference between real refugees and economic migrants. For refugees, we have a responsibility, and for economic migrants, not. And to select flows, I agree, that's the way we can make the difference and show the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Vizovsky from Ukraine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, distinguished colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would not be responding to the uh, statements of the Russian delegations. I want just uh, some brief comment. Uh, uh, our parliamentary assembly or the OC uh, had three resolutions on ongoing Russian aggression and occupation of Crimea, and I hope uh, that the Russian delegation and the Russia as a state will uh, act as uh, it given to the in these resolutions that uh, was brought up here. And uh, uh, for two years, you said that uh, there is no, there were no book at MH17, no rocket, so just see the investigations. I think that uh, everything, uh, everyone know the price of your words. Speaking about the migration and the situation of the migrational crisis, uh, uh, the delegation of Ukraine uh, believes that uh, human rights-based approach need to be applied in all clusters of international migration governance. Uh, this uh, year, and last year, 2015, has become the year with the highest level of forced displacement globally recorded since the World War II. There are a number of factors affecting the forced movements of people, which the unsolved conflicts ranking at the top of them. Uh, in the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees data of 65.3 million people displaced at the end of 2015, 40 uh, million, 40.8 million of, or 63 percent constituted internally displaced persons. This problem seriously affecting a number of the OEC participant states. There are about 1.7 million IDPs, it's nearly 4% of the population, are registered in Ukraine. They, in Ukraine, they fled to the government-controlled areas of Ukraine from violence and gross human rights violations in the temporarily occupied territories of uh, Crimea and city of Sevastopol and from the war and the Russian aggression on Donbass. The Ukrainian authorities undertake consistent and large-scale efforts to help the citizens who had been forced to leave their permanent places of residence, yet under conditions of the ongoing Russian aggression and the economic crisis, it proves to be extremely difficult. We consider a number of recommendations made in relation of to migration during today's session to be relevant in a dealing with the challenges of IDPs, in particular concerning solidarity and enhancing the role of the OEC in this problem. Let me, when we speak about human rights, let me uh, remind you of the fate of the Crimean Tatars, the endangered uh, people of the illegally occupied Crimea, who are forced to repression and persecution to flee their native land and become IDPs. The strains and risks generated by the forced large internal displacement of persons highlight the need to launch a meaningful discussion on the liberation of a comprehensive international instrument to deal with the protection of rights of the IDPs. And the OC has a key role in Please this, conclude. In this uh, uh, theme, in this area. Thank you. And now Mr. Kent from Sweden. <coughs> Thank you. Just a short remark. Um, first of all, out of my own country's experience, uh, I think it's important to reflect also over time on, on this question with refugees. I come from a country just three generations back, uh, was one of the poorest, definitely poorest countries in Europe. One fourth of our population fled my country, mainly to the United States, as hunger refugees. And today we have about 9 million people living as Swedish Americans in the United States. It, of course it's normal, if you cannot even find food, if you cannot find protection and shelter, people of course try to go for a better life somewhere else. It's normal. It's a survival game. Today we, we have Europe uh, which are facing a, a refugee crisis. And I think we, we have had a memory of our own experience when we have been the per capita country receiving the most refugees in Europe. We don't see them as a problem. We have an experience from the war here in the Balkans where we received between 50 and 60,000 Bosnians coming to our country. 
Today, they are a very important part of generating the wealth of my society. There is a huge potential in every person if we give them a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to give the floor to our speakers to make some comments about what was said from the floor. First, uh, Mr. Lombardi. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, dear colleagues, I think uh, our uh, very fruitful debate this morning has indicated that migration issues are already one of the top priorities of our organization, at least at parliamentary level. It must become the case also at ministerial level, and we're all looking forward to the Hamburg ministerial conference in order to see that uh, OSCE is acting and not only talking about uh, this uh, crisis. Secondly, I think we, understand, we understood in the debate this morning that it's not only a question of managing the flow of uh, refugees, but also trying to address its causes, trying to reduce the flow, because it is not human and not civilized to just say, OK, move millions of people, uh, we will have uh, damages in their countries of origin, we will have damages in the countries they are passing through, we will have damages and problems in the countries uh, who will, uh, which are going to host them at the end, just because we are not able to address the causes and to create the conditions for a civilized and dignified migration, which has always been part of the history, we know it uh, very well. We have to support the countries of origin in their economic development and in their stability. Stop destabilizing them would already be a good step. Stop protracted conflicts, which are uh, in many countries the, must, the first reason of these uh, uh, flows. We have to support the neighboring countries in their efforts to keep migrants there and make it possible that they go back home when the situation has been stabilized and thereby helping the countries of origin not to lose the maybe the best part, the more active part, the younger uh, male population uh, in, uh, in this uh, flow of uh, migration. We have to come not only to control but also to combat very efficiently any trafficking, any criminal organization who are try which are trying uh, to influence and make profit of all the paths of uh, migration, of this migration flow, including, including the attempt to manage, to penetrate the management of uh, camps or, uh, um, uh, or uh, to influence the management of migrants in the hosting countries. Finally, we have to facilitate the integration of the migrants who have, who have arrived in the hosting countries. We have to facilitate this in particular in the labor process. We don't want to create millions of unemployed needing for uh, years and years uh, social help in the hosting countries. And last but not least, we have to combat against radicalization on both sides, political, ideological, religious radicalization. We believe in a mankind where people can live together with different origins, different beliefs, different political views, different color of, uh, of the skin. We believe in this kind of uh, society and we have to combat very strongly, firmly, any form of radicalization, of course, in particular, any terrorist infiltration. Thank you very much. Mr. Gianluca Rocco, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Very interesting discussion. Uh, let, me, let me pick on a couple of points that we heard this morning. Information. Yes, it's true. Most or many of those migrants that were coming into Europe they didn't have proper information about asylum. 
They thought that they can come into into Germany and get a job and a Mercedes and uh, live there forever. That is true. But we need also to look at the other side of the information. We have to provide information to the citizens of these countries. We have to, to, to fight the rhetoric that, is, that we hear every day because the numbers that we are seeing coming of those coming into Europe, they, they, they should not be a problem. We should not be afraid of, of this, these people coming in our communities. On the other side, what I also heard today is a lot of discussions around asylum and refugee status. We cannot reduce the migration flows to asylum and refugee status. We have to talk about all those, as the colleague from Sweden was correctly mentioned, that they are trying to change their life, and there is no wall that will f stop this flow. We have to start thinking on how to deal with this issue, because we will not solve this issue by granting asylum to only to those that, uh, that are entitled to asylum. Yes, we, we, can, we can try to solve it by investing in the countries of origin, like Italy said. Maybe thinking that Lampedusa started 10 years ago. It didn't start two years ago. It's 10 years ago that Lampedusa started to receive migrants. Maybe we lost some time in looking in what to do in the countries of origin. But even that will not be enough. It's a combination of different issues. At the moment, in the EU framework, the only way for migrants to, to come and, and stay in the EU, the only regulations that we have cleared enough are related to asylum and family reunification. With these two regulations only, we cannot solve or manage the problem of migration flows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister Spasovsky, the floor is yours. Благодарам многу закам да се заблагодарам за оваа плодна дискусија заради тоа што ова е тема што е предизвик за сите нас, посебно за нас кои што сме од малите држави кои што се наоѓаме на западно балканската рута, кои што се соочуваме со еден огромен прилив на Бегалци, меѓутоа при тоа имајќи во виде дека мораме да го понудиме тој хуманитарен аспект за секој од овие луѓе кои што заминуваат од сопствените држави и бараат спас некаде во некоја од другите земји и воедно да ја зачуваме безбедноста и стабилноста на граѓаните на Република Македонија, граѓаните од регионот. Сите ние и во денешната дебата истакнуваме решенија, односно пристап како да ги надминуваме последиците од ова мигрантска криза. Тоа многу е важно и треба да се бара решение на изворот на, на проблемот. Таму каде што потекнуваат причините од кои што овие луќе решиле да ги напуштат собствените домови и држави и да заминуваат некаде на, на друго место. И затоа мора преку таа глобална со работка да интензивно се работи во наредниот период да се бара решение на оваа криза меѓутоа таму на изборот на проблемот. Ние само можеме да се справуваме со последиците и тоа мора да го правиме координирано заеднички преку развој на многу регионални иницијативи. Јас сум задоволен што имаме одлична соработка со државите од регионот и со Србија и со Хрватска и со сите останати бидејќи ако секоја државите самостојно пристапува кон оваа мигрантска криза само можеме да создадеме дополнителни проблеми и за себе и за другите затоа таа соработка која што имаме помошта која што доаѓа од Европската унија 
сакаме да продолжи и понатаму, заради тоа што на Македонија е потребна помош, а решението на оваа криза може да дојде заеднички од сите, сите нас. Ви благодарам на денешната дебата. Thank you very much. This concludes this debate. Thanks to all who participate and to all who listen. This important debate about discussion on improving, improving human rights based governance in international migration. But as it was said, we heard a lot of words and now we need actions and now all our hope our eyes and our attention is focused in December in the ministerial council and in the measures that will be approved I hope in that ministerial council that is very important for us for the action that, that we really need in OSC area. Now, don't move from your places. We are going to end this session and we have Madam Mutonan, our president, to address this assembly and conclude this session. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Isabel Santos. Thank you for having this uh, talk here, all of you here at uh, the podium. Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, distinguished guests, uh, we have come to an end. Um, after three days of learning from each other and debating the way forward for the OEC region, we know this conference has been fruitful. Over the past three years, we have heard a wide range of views from experts, parliamentarians, OEC officials, and high-level representatives of this wonderful country. I once again thank our hosts for all they have done to make this meeting a success, and I think you should give them a hand. I know you had a lot of work and you will be happy to have um, a peaceful time the next weeks maybe or days. <laughs> we have discussed how to strengthen confidence building measures, how to address the migration crisis, how to improve our good governance, strategies for it. We heard from representatives of all six field operations in this region yesterday who offered valuable insight into the work of the OEC on the ground here. To make the results of our discussion most meaningful, we must, upon returning to our capitals, turn them into concrete plans we can implement in our countries and on the international level, as uh, Isabel had said before. So let us all commit ourselves to working towards these objectives. In my opening speech on Friday, as you, as you may recall, I quoted Mother Teresa. And to the, today, I would like to leave you with one more quote from this Skopje native. She said, we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. Thank you very much, dear friends. So we go on, keep on working, we go home, we try to implement the measures at home, have a safe journey back home, and I'm looking forward to see you all at last in Vienna. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.